Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue thinking about volcanoes and volcanic hazards. So the next thing we're going to cover is how do shield volcanoes form and this is going to correspond to section 6.4 of your textbook. So in front of us you can see we have an image of the island of Hawaii and we know the island of Hawaii is a very volcanically active island. So the first thing we need to think about is why is Hawaii a very volcanically active island? Now, we know Hawaii is situated over a hotspot. So the formation of a hotspot is due to a mantle plume. So this is a very hot ball of uh, extremely warm mantle rocks which come from the very deep mantle. They come flying up through the mantle and as they're rising through the mantle, the pressure drops. And so we get decompression, partial melting of these mantle rocks. And this obviously ends up producing a mafic magma. And this mafic magma has risen through the oceanic crust and it's been erupted onto the seafloor and eventually it's ended up in the formation of Hawaii. So the island of Hawaii contains three very large volcanoes. There's Mauna Kea, Kilauea and Mauna Loa. Now, interestingly, when you look at Mauna Loa in particular, you look at it and you think to yourself, well, that volcano looks very, very tall, and that doesn't quite fit with the type of morphology which we assume we should have with a shield volcano. So because the lava which is erupted from shield volcanoes is of a mafic composition, we know it's going to have a low viscosity, so it's going to flow very easily. And so this means that volcanic eruptions and the lava flows which they produce will flow laterally over very, very large distances. And so we would expect our shield volcanoes to have a very broad, so they're going to be very, very wide shape. But compared to their width, they're not actually going to be that high. So they're going to have a shape, something like a shield, hence the name. Now, in the case of Mauna Loa, you'll notice that it, you know, it, it's actually very, very tall. So it's a very, very high volcano, but it doesn't seem that wide compared to its width. So that doesn't quite work. The reason is, is that Mauna Loa is actually huge. It's about 9,000 meters in height, so it's very, very tall. So it extends all the way from the seafloor, all the way up to the volcano crater up here. So at 9,000 meters, it's the world's largest volcano, and it's also the world's largest mountain. So this means that the vast majority of Mauna Loa is actually below sea level, so you can't see it. So that, that, you know, that helps to explain why it doesn't look as wide as you would expect it to. But uh, if you could actually see all of it, you know, in the, you know, for instance, if the sea level was low enough, you would see that what you actually had was an extremely wide volcano, which compared to its width wasn't actually that tall. So um, in terms of the volcanic eruptions that we get, uh, we have volcanic eruptions which come from fissures and we have volcanic eruptions which come from vents. So in terms of these three volcanoes, the vast majority of the lava is extruded onto the surface via fissure eruptions. So this is when huge amounts of lava get extruded out. And this produces very, very large, very, very extensive lava flows which cover the surrounding area. And so we know that most of the rocks which form due to these volcanoes erupting are going to be you know, vesicular or just uh, non-vesicular basalts. Now, when we do have uh, individual vents, they can lead to the formation of lava fountains. And you can see one right here where the lava is getting ejected out onto the surface with great force. And we know the ejection of this lava is due to the loss of gas. So we know gas bubbles are forming, that causes a volume expansion, and that forces the lava out onto the surface of the earth under pressure and sends it flying into the air. And we know that the blobs of lava that break off this lava fountain as they fly through the air, they cool down very, very quickly. The, the gas bubbles in them get trapped inside this cooling piece of rock. And so this means we end up with pieces of a rock which we refer to as scoria. So in the case of both the scoria and the basalt, which forms from the lava flows, they both have a mafic composition. Now, in terms of some of these volcanoes, and this particular image is of the top of Kilauea, you can see that we have ourselves a small caldera. So a caldera is simply a depression on the surface of the earth within which you will have 
typically some smaller volcanoes. So how is this caldera forming? Well, this caldera is forming due to a shallow magma chamber. So not far under the surface here, there is a magma chamber that's supplying magma to be erupted onto the surface of the earth. Now, the thing is, is, is if the amount of magma exiting the chamber is larger than the inflow of new magma into the chamber, you have a net loss. So you're extruding more magma onto the surface of the earth than is coming into the magma chamber to replace it. And so this means your magma chamber is going to shrink, just like letting air out of a balloon. Now, this shrinkage of the magma chamber creates empty space, and in nature you can't really have empty space, it has to get filled by something. And so what happens is, is the roof of the magma chamber drops down into the magma chamber to fill up the empty space created. And so what you're seeing here is the formation of a caldera, which reflects the presence of a magma chamber under the surface. So in terms of the styles of the style of eruptions that we get associated with shield volcanoes, we have two primary styles. The first one is a fissure eruption. As you can see here, here we have our fissure. So it's a, a linear crack on the surface of the earth. And through this fissure, you can have very, very large amounts of, of lava being extruded, which will then cover the surrounding area in the form of lava flows. Now you'll notice that this particular fissure eruption at the moment uh, is producing several lava fountains. So you can see these uh, balls of uh, basaltic or mafic lava, should I say, that are being thrown into the air. They'll be highly vesicular. And this will lead to the formation of large amounts of scoria along the margin of the fissure. And you can actually see that here as this rather gritty looking material. So that's all scoria there. Now, the vast majority of the lava that's extruded, though, will not form scoria. It will simply flow away from the fissure in the form of lava flows, which will obviously then cool and solidify to give us, uh, to give us basalt. Now, we've also discussed that there will be, the, uh, will be a situation where we have isolated vents like this one that we can see right here. And in, this, in that instance, we are likely to get lava fountains. So once again, we have the lava being pushed out uh, under pressure, and that leads to the formation of a lava fountain. And so once again, um, around this area, we're going to have a buildup of scoria. So we're going to end up forming a cindercone volcano. However, the cindercone volcano will, often, will be what we often refer to as a parasitic volcano. So it's a small scoria cone volcano, or sorry, should I say cindercone volcano, which is located on the flank, so on the sides of a much larger shield volcano. But it's, it's still considered to be part of the same system. Now, in both of these instances, we can see that we have the basaltic lava being extruded onto the surface of the earth. So, as, uh, on, should I say, above sea level. Now, the next question is, well, what would happen if these eruptions were to take place below sea level? Well, when mafic lavas get extruded onto the seafloor, we end up forming a rather distinctive texture, which is referred to as pillow or pillowed basalts. And these basalts are the result of the very, very hot mafic lava coming into contact with the very, very cold seawater. So the lava cools very, very quickly. So you can kind of imagine it as being similar to a tube of toothpaste. So imagine you've got a tube of toothpaste and you squeeze it a little bit. And so some of the toothpaste comes out. So that's your lava. Now imagine the toothpaste is being squeezed out and it's instantly cooling down and, and solidifying and becoming solid. So essentially you end up forming this solid lump at the end of your tube of toothpaste. That would be one pillow. But you keep pushing the tube of toothpaste, so you keep trying to force more out. So eventually this pillow, which is at the, at, the, uh, at the mouth of your tube of toothpaste, fails, and then more toothpaste squirts out of the crack that forms. That then cools down, solidifies, and forms another pillow, and so on and so on and so on. So this process of uh, pillows forming, breaking, a new pillow forming, that new pillow then breaks, forms another pillow. And so you end up forming this rather lumpy looking texture, which is the result of multiple pillows or pillow basalt flows building up one on top of another. And when we see this particular texture, we know instantly that this basalt must have been extruded onto the seafloor rather than above sea level, like these two examples over here. Okay, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.